with us. Our next speaker is, uh, is Richard Blasco, who uh, now describes himself as Senior Electoral Management consulting, a Consultant specializing in elections, campaign, finance, redistribution, legislation, planning, policy, research, and democratic development. So he probably has the longest um, uh, business card of any of our uh, panelists. And, and I think it's probably fair to say also the, uh, the greatest uh, depth uh, of experience uh, and hands-on uh, knowledge of, uh, of how elections work, uh, what are the ins and outs of, uh, of enforcing uh, election rules, and, and in as many recommendations I know to the Manitoba legislature, um, during the 20 years that he served as, as Chief Electoral Officer, um, actually provided quite a bit of practical advice uh, on how to uh, raise uh, voter participation and, and make access to, uh, to voting uh, 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 more equitable for, for Manitobans. Um, he's conducted uh, numerous general elections as, uh, as the overall uh, uh, manager of, of elections in Manitoba, uh, regulated campaign finances, and served as commissioner on several boundary redistributions. Uh, he has over 30 years of uh, experience in that field uh, overall, at both the federal and provincial levels uh, in Canada, and has also contributed to international de democratic development as a mission leader, uh, member or trainer in nearly a dozen international assistance and observation missions. Mr. Velasco completed a BA and an MA in international relations and Canadian politics at the University of Manitoba and his PhD coursework in international relations and Canadian politics at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Richard Blasco. Thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. And what I've learned about business cards and long titles is that uh, you're more likely to stay retired if no one understands what you actually do. And <laughs> I'm quite pleased with that. I'm quite pleased to be here this afternoon and to share with you uh, some thoughts about uh, the bill before us. And I want to thank uh, Royce as well for his uh, comments. As I know, Paul's will be tremendously informative as well. Uh, my comments are from the perspective of a career election official and someone who has experience not only with the content of the legislation, but with the amendment process itself. And I'll also be offering some thoughts about how some of the amendments uh, may play out on the ground. So one might ask at the outset, how are election bills typically arrived at? Well, in my experience, the norm is that electoral legislation, uh, the amendment of that, really broadly requires consultation, and very hard work over a considerable period of time to achieve consensus. Arriving at recommendations for amendments uh, typically involves uh, continuous meetings with political party advisory committees. And once arrived at, recommendations are placed before the public through annual reports uh, of the chief electoral officer that include the recommendation, the rationale for the recommendation, and a detailed uh, analysis of the recommendation itself. Now, of course, sometimes the recommendation of the Chief Electoral Officer do not have the support of the uh, political parties. Um, they are the recommendations of the CEO, after all, at the end of the day. Uh, but nevertheless, consultation uh, plays a very important part because it's best to know what the concerns are as early as possible in the process and to take account of them as best you can, as early as you can in the process. But this is not to say that governments do not include uh, in electoral legislation their own uh, policy initiatives. For example, in Manitoba, provisions to introduce an advertising expense limit separate from, but part of the overall election expense limit was introduced by one government. When that government was defeated, the legislation was repealed. When that government was returned years later, the legislation was reintroduced. But overall, most of the amendments on election law over the past couple of decades in Manitoba at least were those recommended by the CEO following consultation and mostly with consensus of the political party advisory committees. It's also been my experience in Manitoba under governments of different political stripes that each sought to consult ex ex um, to a tremendous extent with the CEO and each involved the CEO in the drafting of legislation and actually directly hands-on in the drafting of legislation. At the federal level as well, broad consultation, including consultation with the CEO and including consultation with advisory committees, has also been um, something that's marked the process. But it's not always the case. And it's certainly not specified anywhere that it, that it must be the case. But Bill 23 uh, does mark a departure from the norm. Um, but then again, as I say, the norm is not something that's imposed. It's something that, that develops. And so not surprisingly, today we see controversy around the bill because some of the major stakeholders are, for the first time, understanding the impact uh, of the bill. So in looking at the bill, uh, what criteria might be helpful to us? The government described three purposes of the amendments as improving service to electors, 
providing clear and simple rules for everyone to follow, and ensuring fair elections. And certainly these are very laudable uh, goals. But to me, uh, the most elegant and contemporary standard is that recently enunciated by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2012, when ruling on an application to overturn an election in the electoral uh, district of Etobicoke Center. In Opitz versus Wisniewski, the Supreme Court of Canada in the majority explained their decision by reference to the Canada Elections Act and its essential purpose. The majority did so in a way that really resonates with me, uh, stating that the act must balance several um, different uh, values and objectives, and sometimes those values and objectives are complementary and sometimes they're in conflict. Values such as certainty of the process, fairness of the process, accessibility of the process, but the court affirmed that the central value of the charter is that the central value is the charter protected right to vote. The majority declared the procedural safeguards in the act are important, however they should not be treated as ends in themselves. In a similar way with respect to election financing laws, uh, we're reminded of one of the basic purposes of those laws being to level uh, the playing field so that one party can simply not overwhelm the marketplace of ideas in an election. Okay, so let's take a few minutes to look at uh, Bill C-23 through the lens of enfranchisement and uh, pursuit of a level playing field. Let me zero in on a number of specifics of the bill which have been drawn into the debate, including enfranchisement, public engagement, investigations, compliance tools, and elections finances. And let me reassure you just a moment or two on each. You won't be here till, till dinner time. First, let's consider enfranchisement. Since 2007, in federal elections, proof of identity and address are required in order to vote. And there's three basic ways to go about establishing that. And two of them require documents that include your address. But the third way is where the individual presenting themselves to vote would have two documents as to identity, and then have someone on the list for that polling division vouch for them as to their residence. And so voting really is a, it's a fail-safe uh, to permit voting. And according to Elections Canada, voting was relied on by well over 100,000 voters in the last federal election. So there's clear evidence that voting is enfranchising of otherwise qualified voters. Per Elections Canada, in particular, voting is relied upon by youth, seniors, and in Aboriginal communities. The bill would eliminate voting, and importantly to my mind, not replace it with anything comparable. As I understand it, the rationale for this amendment is to respond to voter fraud, um, or the potential for voter fraud. And at this point, there may be some confusion if you follow this in the newspapers and the debates um, about honest mistakes by poll officials who at polling places sometimes and often fail to follow the exact procedures and document it properly, which was recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada in the case I referred to earlier, which is the basis of a compliance report that was commissioned by Elections Canada, the so-called Newfeld Report. The difference between that and, on the other hand, actual fraud, which is a very different thing. So now let's turn to public engagement. Um, it's been a well-established trend over decades uh, to have a proactive mandate for electoral authorities, not only to inform voters of the nuts and bolts of voting, but also to engage and to promote the act of voting. Under Bill C-23, the federal CEO will be restricted to informing voters only about how and where to vote, when to vote, and how to be a candidate. Absolutely critical messages, to be certain, but narrow compared to the mandate uh, at the moment and compared to the mandate across Canada and the mandate among many such agencies internationally. And in fact, I believe there exists a very strong rationale as well as very strong public support for the current mandate. For example, in Manitoba, where I'm most familiar with the data, over three provincial elections, quite consistently, eight in 10 voters, uh, sorry, eight in 10 non-voters and nine in 10 voters at least somewhat support the central election agency having a responsibility to encourage voting. In fact, about half of all non-voters and seven in 10 voters strongly support the public information mandate of, electoral, of the electoral agency. Voter engagement is not a zero-sum game. It is not a competition. Electoral agencies play a critical role in part because there are no potential or perceived conflicts of interest with the agency. They reach out to voters regardless of demographics, regardless of locale, etc. And voter engagement, and particularly the translating engagement into voting, is a very complex matter. And so I'd submit we need all the help we can get on this one, uh, including uh, the electoral agencies. With regard to, uh, with regard to investigations, um, Bill C-23 would move the Commissioner of Canada Elections from Elections Canada to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, as Royce mentioned, 
which is overseen by the Department of Justice. Now, some may see any movement of the function away from the CEO prima facie as a bad thing, arguing that the purpose of the commissioner can only be accomplished uh, under the authority within the organization of Elections Canada. And there are certainly arguments for that. But there may also be value, and I stress in the right circumstances, of moving investigations out from under the mandate of the federal CEO, allowing the CEO to focus more on compliance assistance to political parties. But where you move from is only half the equation. Where you move to is extremely important. And under this bill, the appointment of the commissioner and the location of the mandate migrates from an office of parliament to an office of government. And in fact, moving the function to an office of government may well set the stage for a perception, at least, somewhere down the road, that somehow government itself is influencing investigations or is being shown favoritism. If the issue is simply codifying the de facto independence of the commissioner from the CEO, then that can be achieved very simply by existing provisions uh, in the bill, which are helpful. And to my mind, if the commission were to migrate away from the federal CEO, then the favored resting spot would be an independent office of parliament, the office of the commissioner. Of course, it's always preferred that the compliance tools be improved wherever the uh, mandate comes to rest. And I'd agree with the federal CEO that the toolkit, as he calls it, at the disposal of the commissioner needs to be strengthened, including, as he's recommended, the authority to compel witnesses uh, to provide information, which authority, by the way, is, is not uncommon across Canada, which is not the case federally. In terms of compliance assistance, again, another place where I think the bill is very helpful is it recognizes the value of political party advisory committees, as well as requiring the CEO to issue interpretations and guidelines, uh, opinions to political parties and candidates on request to help them to comply with the law. Albeit the CEO has some legitimate concerns about timing, I think the notion is a very helpful one. The bill does also require, in a positive way I believe, political party auditors to conduct compliance audits on the financial returns that are filed to Elections Canada. That adds credibility to the disclosure uh, that's apparent on the return. Um, but in the same vein, the bill does not follow up on, on enabling the CEO to require the production of supporting documents um, to the return to substantiate the expenditures and income similar to what may be required by CEOs in other Canadian jurisdictions and elsewhere. Finally, a few thoughts about what Bill C-23 means to the regulation of elections finances and leveling the playing field. This bill increases the upper limits on contributions and election expenses, and certainly one may accept or dispute the fact that these increases are necessary, uh, but they are very transparent change, and they're explained in relation to uh, the elimination of union and corporate uh, donations and the end to the annual per vote public funding of political parties. One other very consequential amendment in this bill, which may not initially at least appear to be as apparent, is the impact of the removal of fundraising costs as election expenses that's provided for in the bill. That's provided that the costs are incurred in relation to individuals who have made a political contribution of at least $20 over the last five years. Now, in the face of it, it may seem like a very simple, straight change, but on further examination, we realize it creates an increase in the amount of money that may be spent in an election, given that right now, the costs to raise funds during an election are included in the overall expense limit. We don't know what percentage that would be. I certainly don't know, I have a calculation on the percentage that would be, but by removing those costs from your overall election expenses, certainly the limit uh, would appear to be, be going up in addition to the straight ahead 5% increase. The bill does provide that the solicitation has to be for fundraising and not for voter identification, not for get out the vote. But on the ground, I can only anticipate that this will be a very difficult uh, hair to split and potentially cause a lot of uh, confusion out there as to what's allowable and perhaps what's not allowable. The bill also does not address election spending in the year of a set date election. And if the date of an upcoming election is known in advance, but the expenditures are limited only during the election period, then how can the legislation achieve properly its objectives of leveling the playing field? The bill doesn't address this, even though the CEO has raised the issue before. And in fact, again, it's dealt with elsewhere. Uh, in Manitoba, for example, in the year of a set date election, the advertising expenses and the promotional expenses of the political parties and the candidates are all subject to an overall limit in the year of a set date election.
So, uh, Bill uh, C-23 has set in motion a process, and the process has certainly uh, engaged lots of Canadians of various viewpoints, encouraging some and uh, enraging others. But to me, in my background, what's, what's really most important right now is rigorous review, transparent arguments, constructive ideas, alternate ideas, and hopefully thoughtful amendments to the bill are possible. Because at the end of the day, what is important is the enfranchisement and public confidence in the electoral process and in its institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.